Okay, our, our next speaker today will be uh, Dr. Colin Barker. He's one of our interventional cardiologists uh, here at Methodist. And uh, now we are in the cath lab, finally got there. And uh, after all of these different tests that we do, uh, what is the comparative role of o OCT, IVIS, and FFR and CAD assessment? Yeah, I thought you forgot about the cath lab. I was getting worried <laughs> there. So somehow, though, people do end up in the cath lab without one of these elegant tests, <laughs> even in 2017. <laughs> so we have to figure out what to do with them. All right. So um, we'll go just through some basic things we can do in the cath lab. And the, the first uh, and most important, and really what's become the gold standard of assessing coronary artery disease or obstructive coronary artery disease is physiologic assessment, and we'll talk about FFR as well as IFR, introduce those concepts and go over some of the uh, clinical data. Of course, we've always had anatomic assessment with invasive angiography, but we have complementary uh, anatomic assessments with intravascular ultrasound and OCT, and we'll look at a few case examples and um, how we utilize these anatomic assessments in 2018. And I'll, we'll go through this by looking at some clinical data. So this is um, an image from a review by Lance School just a few years ago that highlights the limitation of our sort of ocular assessment of obstructive coronary artery disease. And these were models with known degree stenosis. Um, and at the top, you have a 33% and then a 50% in the second row. But what's um, impressive is that that third row, that's only a 67% stenosis. When I can tell you plenty of times I've seen people in the cath lab quantify that much more severe. And then the bottom one is only 83%, and I can guarantee you in a cath lab that would be called something closer to 99%. Um, so that's when we, I think, in these days are obligated when there's some sort of uh, discrepancy or uncertainty a physiologic assessment is necessary to complement um, our invasive angiography. So I'll ask a few questions as we go through this as well, and in all fairness, these are mostly interventional questions, but um, hopefully <laughs> I won't call on anyone. But FFR is an invasive measurement of hemodynamically significant stenosis. And uh, the cutoff, the true cutoff value is less than 0 0.75, FAME used 0 0.8, but, but truly 0 0.75 is the standard. And this has been best validated against which test for ischemia? Exercise ECG, stress echo, myocardial perfusion, I guess I could have put CMR, <laughs> uh, or all of the above. Any takers? Good. I'm glad no one got it right. Um, so this is a Peel study. This is almost actually over 20 years old now. Um, but compared FFR to exercise stress, thallium, and stress echo. And in 21 out of 21 patients who had an FFR of less than 0 0.75, they all had inducible ischemia on the non-invasive tests. And 21 out of 24 of those patients who had an FFR of greater than 0.75 did not have inducible ischemia. So FFR has a sensitivity, specificity, positive negative predictive value, as well as accuracy of 88, 100, 100, 88 and 93%. So a fairly um, robust test. So the answer was actually number D. Uh, all of those tests uh, have been validated with FFR. So here's an example of someone referred for uh, three vessel disease needs a cabbage urgently, a very unstable patient by report. And upon review of the angiogram, the right coronary artery clearly has a lesion. It's quantified as 70%. The LAD has what's quantified as a 50% lesion right there in the middle. I think two things to note that what we've learned physiologically that's probably not going to be significant is it's, down, it's beyond two large diagonals and the large septal. So the distribution of myocardium is directly proportional to the physiologic effect of a stenosis. So a distal to mid LAD is almost never positive, you know, unless it's a critical lesion. Same thing with a non-dominant circ. It's gonna be hard to get a physiologically significant lesion in a vessel like that. But then clearly in the upper um, right, there's a circumflex that has severe disease. So pro the surgeon actually evaluated this and was suspect of the LAD lesion. And when, we, when a FFR was performed, which is time here. Um, the two pressure measurements, red are the aortic pressure, green is the pressure distal to the lesion. 
And you can see after adenosine is administered for hyperemia, the FFR value is 0.93. So the LAD was not significant, and the circumflex was and got treated with a PCI and a resultant normal FFR value. And the RCA um, was questionable, and that's why there's sort of some some multiple measurements, but at least consistent that the RCA was a significant lesion. So that was treated as well. So what this highlights is something that was just published this week in Jack Interventions. And this is a little bit busy and confusing, but let me just briefly walk you through it. So this is the defined real trial. And what went on here, this was several hundred patients underwent invasive angiography. And then the doctor had to commit to a treatment strategy based on the invasive angiography. Subsequently, the arteries all went under a physiologic assessment. And after the physiologic assessment, the um, treating physician could subsequently make another decision about what to do with this patient. So um, a couple of things could happen. Most patients were committed to PCI and then were either converted to cabbage or optimal medical therapy. And within coronary artery disease here on the bottom, there were several cases where it looked like the circumflex was the lesion that was most significant and the LAD was going to be treated medically, but that was subsequently changed uh, to vice versa. And what's really striking is that last, uh, the, the far right pie chart, and that's showing the distribution of the number of um, the percentage of patients whose treatment strategy was changed based on the physiologic assessment, and it was 40%. So pretty striking and remarkable that considering 40% of the patients would have been treated completely different with that, or maybe inappropriately without uh, physiologic assessment. So another uh, sort of interventional question, but also I think a hemodynamic one. So you have a patient with heart failure, uh, has the following hemodynamics, an end diastolic pressure of 25, a right atrial pressure of 20, their CVP essentially, a wedge of 25, elevated PA pressures, has a 50% mid-LAD, and a pressure wire uh, test is performed with hyperemia, showing a coronary pressure of 70 and an aortic pressure of 100. So the true FFR is closest to 0 0.625, 0 0.7, 0 0.75, or 0.8. Any takers? I'll give you a hint. It's not B. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what are we measuring when we measure FFR? I'm not gonna go through all of Ohm's laws and how we do this, but essentially what we're doing is um, we're using the change in pressure um, as a surrogate of flow with the uh, assumption that the resistance distally is essentially null or negligible. And therefore you can just use these two pressure uh, measurements, proximal and distal to the lesion as your um, surrogate for flow and then therefore get your ratio. Uh, what's tricky here is in this patient, the uh, CVP is 20. So the true FFR here would actually be calculated by 100 minus 20 is the denominator and 70 minus 20 is the numerator because that's your, that's your resistance is where your, your outflow is of the coronary sinus. So the, true, the correct answer here is 0 0.625. So now um, we've sort of grown to like a uh, alternative to FFR because it's simpler, it's quicker, it's cheaper, uh, and a little bit less invasive. Patients have less symptoms because we don't have to give adenosine. And that's for instantaneous wave-free ratio. And the idea here is that during a certain point in diastole, you have almost similar to FFR negligible resistance or balance resistance. Uh, distal to the obstruction, and therefore you can come up with a ratio that would be a uh, defined significant obstructive coronary artery disease. And this has now been studied in a couple, several trials, but two large clinical trials presented last year at the ACC, the Defined Flare and the Sweet Heart Study, um, really put IFR on the map in that it showed that IFR and FFR had fairly equivalent clinical outcomes when used to guide the treatment strategy. And the IFR cutoff uh, for significance is 0 0.89. And in these studies, the FFR cutoff for significance was uh, 0 0.8. And this is the primary endpoint for the defined flare study, showing essentially equivalent uh, event rates out to one year with an FFR as well as an IFR guided strategy in that the IFR strategy actually included less revascularization, 
And this was the Swede heart study showing very similar results, essentially overlapping cumulative event rates out to one year. So IFR uh, really has sort of taken over as our go-to for physiologic assessment because of these studies as well as ease of use and um, uh, lack of patient symptoms, cheaper, quicker, et cetera. So that's the physiologic portion of what we can do in the cath lab. We still have complementary uh, ancillary uh, invasive imaging um, equipment such as IVIS. So you observe a senior operator in, in evaluating an intermediate 50% RCA by IVIS because he says if the minimal luminal area is 4.5 millimeters squared, I know it's significant and I can treat it. There's no stress test, there's no ischemia uh, data for a patient with atypical chest pain. So what do you tell them? It's costly and unnecessary to justify PCI. The minimal luminal area only has a modest correlation with FFR. It's a good idea, IVIS will help meet the AUC criteria, or none of my business, do what you want. <laughs> I would probably go with D, I but. <laughs> 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 I'm not, I'm not looking for a fight. I would go with D. But really, IVIS is, is not used to evaluate um, physiology or hemodynamics, but we do use it uh, to evaluate basically things we don't like that we see on angiography. So if we put in a stent and we see something hazy at the distal edge of it or within the stent or the stent doesn't look quite expanded um, or someone comes back with a stent thrombosis and we want to sort of try to get to the bottom of what's the etiology here. Was there a hematoma? Was there a missed distal edge dissection? Um, we, we, IVIS is uh, good at that. Now I'll show you OCT in a minute, which has a little bit better resolution and probably better as far as delineating some of these things. But IVIS is good, it's easy, it's cheap, um, it's quick, and we still use it all the time. But it does not equate to any sort of functional assessment uh, or ischemia. And this is the first study that looked at over 300 patients. And the goal here was try to define a cutoff of uh, what would be significant on IVIS and subsequently correlate to FFR. And you can see looking across all the various, um, so these, these are reference vessel diameters of three, three and a half, and greater than three and a half millimeters. Looking at stenosis, there's no good cutoff point regarding sensitivity, specificity, positive or negative predictive value. Um, so really, what should be used is FFR when it comes to deciding if something should be treated, not uh, IVIS. So the correct answer would be the IVIS MLA only has a modest correlation with FFR, sir. Um, but need needless to be said, I think you were seeing less and less FFR, uh, 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 IVIS being used to guide therapy, really just to guide how we treat. OCT, um, as we've all seen, really, I think, has the, the best imaging. I mean, uh, clearly the highest quality imaging, the highest resolution. You can see every layer of the intima, media, and adventitia, and within the media, you can define the internal and external elastic lamina, and that's actually how we, where we size our stents um, to the EEL, because that'll give you the, uh, most, the, the best opposed and the best um, sort of stent result uh, when sizing on the EEL. But again, it doesn't give us any physiologic information, but can give us very high res information about the makeup of plaques, whether they're fibrous or fiber fatty. We can nicely define calcium, which may actually change our way of intervening if we have to do some sort of plaque, plaque modification. Can also delineate what kind of thrombus we're dealing with and if there's a stent that's put in with subsequent, you know, again, this would be something on that far bottom right you see on your angiogram, it looks a little hazy inside the stent and you can occasionally see plaque protrusion. Um, so in summary, given the limitations of angiography, um, having these alternative and complementary techniques in the cath lab is now essential. Really, the physiologic assessment with FFR and IFR um, are paramount, and they are the tests that are used to decide whether we should intervene. And IVIS and OCT define anatomy and help us guide how to treat something, as well as evaluate the outcome of a PCI and further um, define any sort of uh, haziness, et cetera, that we don't like on angiography. With that, I'll thank you.